That is why Hill used the term gambling when he referred to the stock market. These average people weren't investing in companies. They were betting on the future rise in value. The idea, in the average person's mind, was that they would only have to scrape together enough to pay the margin, which was a small percentage of the full cost. Then when the price of the stock went up, they would sell, which would give them more than enough money to pay the broker the balance owing on the purchase price, and they could pocket the difference. This worked fine as long as stock prices continued to rise, but when the stock market crashed, the stockbrokers called in the margins, and the people who had bought at prices they really couldn't afford suddenly found that they had to come up with the cash. And that was why so many average people got wiped out in the crash of 29. They gambled money they didn't have by buying on margin. This is the end of the editor's comments. 13. Lack of a well-defined power of decision. Those who succeed reach decisions promptly and change them very slowly. Those who fail reach decisions very slowly and change them frequently and quickly. Indecision and procrastination are twins. Where one is found, the other is also usually found. Kill off this pair before they completely tie you to the treadmill of failure. 14. One or more of the six basic fears. Fear of poverty, fear of criticism, fear of ill health, fear of loss of love, fear of old age, and fear of death. You will find an in-depth analysis of these six basic fears in the final chapter. They must be mastered before you can market your services effectively. 15. Wrong selection of a mate in marriage. This is a most common cause of failure. The relationship of marriage brings people intimately into contact. Unless this relationship is harmonious, failure is likely to follow. Moreover, it will be a form of failure that destroys ambition. 16. Overcaution. The person who takes no chances generally has to take whatever is left when others are through choosing. Overcaution is as bad as undercaution. Both are extremes to be guarded against. Life itself is filled with the element of chance. 17. Wrong selection of associates in business. This is one of the most common causes of failure in business. In marketing personal services, you should use great care to select an employer who will be an inspiration and who is intelligent and successful. We emulate those with whom we associate most closely. Pick an employer who is worth emulating. 18. Superstition and Prejudice Superstition is a form of fear. It is also a sign of ignorance. Successful people keep open minds and are afraid of nothing. 19. Wrong Selection of a Vocation you cannot have outstanding success in work that you do not like. The most essential step in the marketing of personal services is that of selecting an occupation into which you can throw yourself wholeheartedly. Although money or circumstances may require you to do something you don't like for a time, no one can stop you from developing plans to make your goal in life a reality. Editor's Comments most contemporary experts agree with Napoleon Hill's statement that finding the work you love is of key importance in achieving success that is truly rewarding. This concept coincides so well with modern attitudes that it has inspired a number of books, including Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers, Wishcraft by Barbara Scher, and Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow by Marcia Sinatar. All three books became bestsellers by expanding upon that single concept. This is the end of the editor's comments. 20. Lack of concentration of effort. The jack of all trades seldom is good at any. Concentrate all of your efforts on one definite chief aim. 21. The habit of indiscriminate spending. 
You cannot succeed if you are eternally in fear of poverty. Form the habit of systematic saving by putting aside a definite percentage of your income. Money in the bank gives you a very safe foundation of courage when bargaining for the sale of personal services. Without money, you must take what you are offered and be glad to get it. 22. Lack of Enthusiasm Without enthusiasm, you cannot be convincing. Moreover, enthusiasm is contagious, and the person who has it under control is generally welcome in any group of people. 23. Intolerance The person with a closed mind on any subject seldom gets ahead. Intolerance means that you have stopped acquiring knowledge. The most damaging forms of intolerance are those connected with religious, racial, and political differences of opinion. 24. Intemperance The most damaging forms of intemperance are connected with overeating, alcohol, drugs, and sexual activities. Overindulgence in any of these can be fatal to success. 25. Inability to cooperate with others. More people lose their positions and their big opportunities in life because of this fault than for all other reasons combined. It is a fault that no well-informed business person or leader will tolerate. 26. Possession of power that was not acquired through self-effort. Sons and daughters of wealthy parents and others who inherit money that they did not earn. Power in the hands of one who did not acquire it gradually is often fatal to success. Quick riches are more dangerous than poverty. 27. Intentional dishonesty. There is no substitute for honesty. You may be temporarily dishonest because of circumstances over which you have no control without permanent damage. But there is no hope for you if you are dishonest by choice. Sooner or later, your deeds will catch up with you, and you will pay by loss of reputation and perhaps even loss of liberty. 28. Egotism and Vanity These qualities serve as red lights that warn others to keep away. They are fatal to success. 29. Guessing instead of thinking. Most people are too indifferent or lazy to acquire facts with which to think accurately. They prefer to act on opinions created by guesswork or snap judgments. 30. Lack of capital. This is a common cause of failure among those who start out in business for the first time. You must have a sufficient reserve of capital to absorb the shock of your mistakes and to carry you over until you have established a reputation. 31. Here, name any particular cause of failure from which you have suffered that has not been included in the foregoing list. Contained in these 31 major causes of failure is the description of practically every person who tries and fails. It will be helpful if you get someone who knows you well to go over this list with you and help you to analyze yourself by each of these causes of failure. Most people cannot see themselves as others see them. You may be one who cannot. Do you know your own worth? The oldest of admonitions is know thyself. If you market merchandise successfully, you must know the merchandise. The same is true in marketing personal services. You should know all of your weaknesses in order to bridge them or eliminate them entirely. You should know your strengths in order to call attention to them when selling your services. You can know yourself only through accurate analysis. There is a story about a young man applying for a job who was making a good impression until the manager asked him what salary he expected. He replied that he had no fixed sum in mind, lack of a definite aim. The manager then said, We will pay you all you are worth after we try you out for a week. I can't accept that, the applicant replied. I'm already getting more than that where I'm now employed. 
It may seem funny, but it makes a serious point. Before you even begin to negotiate for a better salary in your present position or begin to seek employment elsewhere, be sure that you are worth more than you now receive. It is one thing to want money. Everyone wants more. But it is something entirely different to be worth more. Many people mistake their wants for their just dues. Your financial wants have nothing whatever to do with your worth. Your value is established entirely by your ability to render useful service or your capacity to induce others to render such service. Take inventory of yourself. Annual self-analysis is essential in the effective marketing of personal services, just like you would take an annual inventory if you were in merchandising. Moreover, your yearly analysis should show a decrease in your faults and an increase in your virtues. You go ahead, stand still, or go backward in life. Your objective should be to go ahead. Annual self-analysis will disclose whether advancement has been made and, if so, how much. It will also disclose any backward steps you may have taken. The effective marketing of personal services requires you to move forward even if the progress is slow. Your annual self-analysis should be made at the end of each year, so you can include in your New Year's resolutions any improvements that the analysis indicates should be made. Take this inventory by asking yourself the following questions and by checking your answers with the aid of someone who will not permit you to deceive yourself. Self-Analysis Questionnaire 1. Have I attained the goal that I established as my objective for this year? You should work with a definite yearly objective to be attained as a part of your major life objective. 2. Have I delivered service of the best possible quality of which I was capable, or could I have improved any part of this service? 3. Have I delivered service in the greatest possible quantity of which I was capable? 4. Has the spirit of my conduct been harmonious and cooperative at all times? 5. Have I permitted the habit of procrastination to decrease my efficiency, and if so, to what extent? 6. Have I improved my personality, and if so, in what ways? 7. Have I been persistent in following my plans through to completion? 8. Have I reached decisions promptly and definitely on all occasions? 9. Have I permitted any of the six basic fears to decrease my efficiency? 10. Have I been either overcautious or undercautious? 11. Has my relationship with my associates in work been pleasant or unpleasant? If it has been unpleasant, has the fault been partly or wholly mine? 12. Have I dissipated any of my energy through lack of concentration of effort? 13. Have I been open-minded and tolerant in connection with all subjects? 14. In what ways have I improved my ability to render service? 15. Have I been intemperate in any of my personal habits? 16. Have I expressed, either openly or secretly, any form of egotism? 17. Has my conduct toward my associates been such that they respect me? 18. Have my opinions and decisions been based upon guesswork or accuracy of analysis and thought? 19. Have I followed the habit of budgeting my time, my expenses, and my income, and have I been conservative in these budgets? 20. How much time have I devoted to unprofitable effort which I might have used to better advantage? 21. How may I rebudget my time and change my habits so I will be more efficient during the coming year? 22. Have I been guilty of any conduct that was not approved by my own conscience? 23. In what ways have I rendered more service and better service than I was paid to render? 24. 
Have I been unfair to anyone, and if so, in what way? 25. If I had been the purchaser of my own services for the year, would I be satisfied with my purchase? 26. Am I in the right vocation, and if not, why not? 27. Has the purchaser of my services been satisfied with the service I have rendered, and if not, why not? 28. What is my present rating on the fundamental principles of success? Make this rating fairly and frankly, and have it checked by someone who is courageous enough to do it accurately. After you have finished reading through to the end of this book at least once, and you are sure you have assimilated the information in this chapter, you will be ready to create a practical plan for marketing your personal services. In this chapter, you should have found adequate descriptions of every principle essential in planning the sale of personal services. These include the major attributes of leadership, the most common causes of failure in leadership, a description of the fields of opportunity for leadership, the main causes of failure in all walks of life, and the important questions that should be used in self-analysis. This extensive and detailed presentation has been included because it will be needed by you if you are going to earn your riches by marketing your personal services. Those who have lost their fortunes and those who are just beginning to earn money have nothing but personal services to offer in return for riches. Therefore, it is essential that you have real, practical information that you'll need to market your services to best advantage. Complete assimilation and understanding of the information will help you to market your services, and it will help you to become more analytical and capable of judging people. The information will be priceless to you if you work in an executive position where you select employees. Where and how to find opportunities to accumulate riches. Now that we have analyzed the principles by which riches may be accumulated, you naturally ask, where can I find the opportunities to apply these principles? Very well. Let us take inventory and see what the United States of America offers the person seeking riches. To begin with, remember that we live in a country where every law-abiding citizen enjoys freedom of thought and freedom of deed unequaled anywhere in the world. Most of us have never taken inventory of the advantages of this freedom. We have never compared our unlimited freedom with a curtailed freedom in other countries. Here we have freedom of thought, freedom in the choice and enjoyment of education, freedom in religion, freedom in politics, freedom in the choice of a business, profession, or occupation, freedom to accumulate and own all the property we can accumulate, freedom to choose our place of residence, freedom in marriage, freedom through equal opportunity to all races, freedom of travel from one state to another, freedom in our choice of foods, and freedom to aim for any station in life for which we have prepared ourselves, even for the presidency of the United States. We have other forms of freedom, but this list gives an overview of the most important freedoms that offer you the opportunity to think and grow rich. The United States is the only country guaranteeing to every citizen, whether native-born or naturalized, so broad and varied a list of freedoms. Next, let us recount some of the blessings that our widespread freedom has placed within our hands. Take the average American family of average income and sum up the benefits available to every member of the family in this land of opportunity and plenty. Food. Next to freedom of thought and deed comes food, clothing, and shelter, the three basic necessities of life. Because of our universal freedom, the average American family has available at its door the choicest selection of food to be found anywhere in the world and at prices within its financial range. Shelter. This family lives in a comfortable apartment or house, complete with light, heat, water, and many conveniences. The toast they had for breakfast was toasted in an electric toaster, which cost but a few dollars. The apartment is cleaned with a vacuum cleaner that is run by electricity. Hot and cold water is available at all times in the kitchen and the bathroom. The food is kept cool in a refrigerator. 
clothes are washed and dried, dishes are clean, and numerous labor-saving devices are run on power obtained by putting a plug into a wall socket. The family receives entertainment and information from all over the world 24 hours a day if they want it, by merely flipping a switch on their radio or television or computer. There are other conveniences, but the foregoing list will give a fair idea of some of the concrete evidences of the freedoms that we, of America, enjoy. Clothing. Anywhere in the United States, the family with average clothing requirements can dress very comfortably at a cost that is only a small portion of their earnings. Only the three basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter have been mentioned. The average American also has other options and advantages that are available in return for reasonable effort. The average American has security of property rights not found in any other country in the world. We can place any surplus money in a bank with the assurance that our government will protect it and make good to us if the bank fails. If an American citizen wants to travel from one state to another, he or she needs no passport and no one's permission. You may go when you please, and you may travel by car, train, bus, airplane, ship, or any other method that you can afford. The Miracle that has provided these blessings. We often hear politicians proclaiming the freedom of America when they solicit votes, but they seldom take the time or trouble to analyze the source of this freedom. Having no axe to grind, no grudge to express, and no ulterior motives, I will give you a frank analysis of that mysterious, abstract, greatly misunderstood something that gives to every citizen of America more blessings, more opportunities to accumulate wealth, and more freedom of every nature than may be found in any other country. I have the right to analyze the source and nature of this unseen power because I know and have known for more than half a century many of the men who organized that power and many who are now responsible for its maintenance. The name of this mysterious benefactor of mankind is capital. Capital consists not only of money, but also of highly organized, intelligent groups of individuals who plan ways and means of using money efficiently for the good of the public and profitably to themselves. These groups consist of scientists, educators, chemists, inventors, business analysts, publicists, transportation experts, accountants, lawyers, doctors, and other men and women who have highly specialized knowledge in all fields of industry and business. They pioneer, experiment, and blaze trails in new fields of endeavor. They support colleges, hospitals, schools, build good roads, publish newspapers, pay most of the cost of government, and take care of the many details essential to human progress. Stated briefly, the capitalists are the brains of civilization because they supply the entire fabric of which all education, enlightenment, and human progress consist. Money without brains is always dangerous. Properly used, it is the most important essential of civilization. To give you an idea of how important organized capital is, try to imagine that it is your job to provide and prepare a simple family breakfast, but you have to do it without the aid of capital. To supply the tea, you would have to make a trip to China or India. Unless you are an excellent swimmer, you would become rather tired before making the round trip. Then, too, another problem would confront you. What would you use for money, even if you had the physical endurance to swim the ocean? To supply sugar, you would have to take another swim to the Caribbean islands or a long walk to the sugar beet section of Utah. But even then you might come back without the sugar because organized effort and money are necessary to produce sugar, to say nothing of what is required to refine, transport, and deliver it to the breakfast table anywhere in the United States. Eggs you could obtain easily enough from nearby farms, but you might have a very long walk to Florida or California and back before you could serve grapefruit juice. You would have another long walk to Kansas or one of the other wheat-growing states when you went after wheat bread. Dry cereal would have to be omitted from the menu because it would not be available except through the labor of a trained group of workers and suitable machinery 
all of which call for capital. After resting, you could take off for another little swim down to South America, where you would pick up a couple of bananas. On your return, you could take a short walk to the nearest farm having a dairy and pick up some butter and cream. Then your family would be ready to sit down and enjoy breakfast. Seems absurd, doesn't it? Well, the procedure described would be the only possible way these simple items of food could be delivered if we had no capitalistic system. The Capital Cornerstone of Our Lives The sum of money required for the building and maintenance of the planes, trucks, trains, and cargo ships used in the delivery of that simple breakfast is so huge that it staggers imagination. It runs into billions of dollars. Not to mention the armies of trained employees required to run all those planes, trucks, ships, and trains. But transportation is only a part of the requirements of modern civilization in capitalistic America. Before there can be anything to haul, something must be grown from the ground or manufactured and prepared for market. This calls for more billions of dollars for equipment, machinery, packaging, marketing, and to pay the wages of millions of men and women. Transportation systems do not spring up from the earth and function automatically. They come in response to the call of civilization. They come through the labor and ingenuity and organizing ability of people who have imagination, faith, enthusiasm, decision, and persistence. These men and women are known as capitalists. They are motivated by the desire to build, construct, achieve, render useful service, earn profits, and accumulate riches. And because they render service without which there would be no civilization, they earn for themselves great riches. Just to keep the record simple and understandable, I will add that these capitalists are the same men and women who are often denounced as the greedy establishment or Wall Street. I'm not attempting to present a case for or against any group or any system of economics. The purpose of this book a purpose to which I have faithfully devoted more than half a century, is to present to anyone who wants the knowledge the most dependable philosophy through which individuals may accumulate riches in whatever amounts they desire. The reasons I have analyzed the economic advantages of the capitalistic system are, one, to point out that all who seek riches must recognize and adapt themselves to the system that controls all approaches to fortunes large or small. 2. To present the side of the picture opposite to the one portrayed by politicians and demagogues and the media, who often refer to organized capital as if it were something poisonous. This is a capitalistic country. It was developed through the use of capital. We who claim the right to partake of the blessings of freedom and opportunity, we who seek to accumulate riches here, should know that neither riches nor opportunity would be available to us if organized capital had not provided these benefits. There is only one dependable method of accumulating and legally holding riches, and that is by rendering useful service. No system has ever been created by which anyone can legally acquire riches through mere force of numbers or without giving in return an equivalent value of one form or another. Your Opportunities in the Midst of Riches America provides all the freedom and all the opportunity to accumulate riches that any honest person may require. When you go hunting for game, you select hunting grounds where game is plentiful. When you are seeking riches, the same rule naturally applies. If it is riches you are seeking, do not overlook the possibilities of a country whose citizens are so rich that women alone spend billions of dollars each year for cosmetics and other beauty products. Do not be in too big a hurry to get away from a country whose men willingly, even eagerly, hand over more billions of dollars annually for football, basketball, baseball, and all the related products that go with these and other sporting events. Only a few of the luxuries and non-essentials have been mentioned, but remember that the business of producing and marketing these few products gives regular employment to many millions of men and women who receive for their services many millions of dollars monthly 
and spend it freely for both the luxuries and the necessities. Especially, remember that behind all this exchange of merchandise and personal services is an abundance of opportunity to accumulate riches. Here, our American freedom comes to your aid. There is nothing to stop you or anyone from engaging in any portion of the effort necessary to carry on these businesses. If you have superior talent, training, experience, you may accumulate riches in large amounts. Those not so fortunate may accumulate smaller amounts. Anyone may earn a living in return for a very nominal amount of labor. So there you are. Opportunity has spread its wares before you. Step up to the front, select what you want, create your plan, put the plan into action, and follow through with persistence. Capitalistic America will do the rest. You can depend on this much. Capitalistic America ensures every person the opportunity to render useful service and to collect riches in proportion to the value of the service. The system denies no one this right, but it does not and cannot promise something for nothing. The system itself is irrevocably controlled by the law of economics, which neither recognizes nor tolerates for long getting without giving. Conceit is a fog that envelops a man's real character beyond his own recognition. It weakens his native ability and strengthens all his inconsistencies. Chapter 9 Decision The Mastery of Procrastination The Seventh Step Toward Riches Analysis of over 25,000 men and women who had experienced failure reveals that lack of decision was near the head of the list of the 31 major causes of failure. Procrastination, the opposite of decision, is a common enemy which practically every person must conquer. You will have an opportunity to test your capacity to reach quick and definite decisions when you finish reading this book and begin to put the principles into action. My analysis of several hundred people who had accumulated fortunes well beyond the million-dollar mark disclosed the fact that every one of them had the habit of reaching decisions promptly and of changing these decisions slowly. People who fail to accumulate money, without exception, have the habit of reaching decisions, if at all, very slowly, and of changing these decisions quickly and often. One of Henry Ford's most outstanding qualities was his habit of reaching decisions quickly and definitely and changing them slowly. This quality was so pronounced in Mr. Ford that it gave him the reputation of being obstinate. It was this quality that prompted Mr. Ford to continue to manufacture his famous Model T, the world's ugliest car, when all of his advisors and many of the purchasers of the car were urging him to change it. Perhaps Mr. Ford delayed too long in making the change. But the other side of the story is that Mr. Ford's firmness of decision yielded a huge fortune before the change in model became necessary. Some say that Mr. Ford's definiteness of decision was just obstinacy, but even this quality is preferable to slowness in reaching decisions and quickness in changing them. Editor's Comments Henry Ford's consistency extended also to the color of the Model T. 15 million of which in 19 years of production from 1908 to 1927 were made only in black and with little change in the design. Shortly after its introduction, Napoleon Hill met with Ford to talk about the principles of success. According to Hill, in Michael Ritt's biography of Napoleon Hill, A Lifetime of Riches, Henry Ford was cold, indifferent, unenthusiastic, and spoke only when forced to unless he was talking about his car. Early on, few people other than Carnegie could foresee the success Ford would achieve, which Hill later attributed to Ford's self-control and concentrated effort. At Hill's first meeting with him in 1911, Ford was interested only in talking about the Model T. 
After Ford took him for a spin around the factory, Hill bought one for $680. This is the end of the editor's comments. Making your own decisions. The majority of people who fail to accumulate the money they need are generally easily influenced by the opinions of others. They permit gossip, rumors, other people's opinions, and the news reporters to do their thinking for them. Opinions are the cheapest commodities on earth. Everyone has a flock of opinions they are ready to tell anyone who will listen. If you are too influenced by other people's opinions when you reach decisions, you will not succeed in any undertaking, much less in that of transmuting your own desire into money. If you are influenced by the opinions of others, you will have no desire of your own. Keep your own counsel. Rely on yourself to reach your own decisions when you begin to put these principles into practice and follow through on your decisions. Take no one into your confidence except the members of your mastermind group and be very sure that you choose for your group only those who will be in complete sympathy and harmony with your purpose. Close friends and relatives, while not meaning to do so, often handicap one through opinions. And for some reason, even friends often seem to think that ridiculing you and your plans is funny. Thousands of men and women carry inferiority complexes with them all through life because some well-meaning but ignorant person destroyed their confidence through opinions or ridicule. You have a brain and mind of your own. Use it and reach your own decisions. If you need facts or information from others to help you reach decisions, acquire the facts or information you need quietly without disclosing your purpose. It is characteristic of people who have a smattering of knowledge to try to give the impression that they know more than they do. Such people generally do too much talking and too little listening. Keep your eyes and ears open and your mouth closed if you wish to acquire the habit of prompt decision. Those who talk too much do little else. If you talk more than you listen, you may miss some important piece of knowledge that might have been very useful to you. By talking too much, you may also disclose your plans and purposes to people who will take great delight in defeating you because they envy you. Remember, every time you open your mouth in the presence of a person who really has knowledge, you tip your hand and show that person your exact stock of knowledge or you tip your hand to your lack of it, the mark of genuine wisdom is modesty and silence. Keep in mind that every person is, like you, seeking the opportunity to accumulate money. If you talk about your plans too freely, you may be surprised when you learn that some other person has beat you to it by using the plans you bragged about. Let one of your first decisions be to keep a closed mouth and open ears and eyes. As a reminder to yourself, copy the following epigram in large letters and place it where you will see it daily. Tell the world what you intend to do, but first, show it. This is the equivalent of saying that deeds and not words are what count most. The value of decisions depends upon the courage required to render them. The great decisions that served as the foundation of civilization were reached by assuming great risks which often meant the chance of death. Lincoln's decision to issue his famous Proclamation of Emancipation, which gave freedom to African Americans, was rendered with full understanding that his act would turn thousands of friends and political supporters against him. When the rulers of Athens gave Socrates the choice of disclaiming his teachings or being sentenced to death, Socrates' decision to drink the cup of poison, rather than compromise in his personal belief, was a decision of courage. It turned time ahead a thousand years and gave to people then unborn the right to freedom.